All right. So last time when we finished our discussion, we were talking about organizational communication, the ways in which hierarchies uh, are formed and maintained, why they're necessary uh, in certain organizations, specifically in the business community. We also talked about the stories that hold organizations together. So things like myths and fantasy themes, you can go back to some of those discussions. Today, we're going to talk about code breaking. Uh, and this is just sort of a, just a, a fun way to learn a few um, learn, learn a few, uh, you know, stories throughout history as far as, you know, where codes have been used. Uh, but we're going to sort of use it allegorically to talk about just sort of when you want to become a part of a group. We have in-groups and out-groups. Part of, part of becoming within, you know, to, to, to get inside of the in-group is learning the ways in which those communication strategies work, all right? So in a business world, it might be things like jargon. Uh, you need to know some of the you know basic vocabulary of the business community you're going into. Uh, but we're you know just gonna have a little bit of fun with it today and talk about some actual code breaking, uh, specifically during sort of you know uh, wartime, uh, World War II uh, specifically. All right. So uh, this is kind of where this discussion's going. It'll be relatively quick, uh, but it's, yeah, it's just sort of a carry on from our last discussion on organizations and sort of how organizations work. And if you want to be a part of those communities, you have to learn to speak uh, the language. All right, so communication connects us. Different cultures have different languages and dialects. So the difference between a language and a dialect, languages are completely different sets of vocabulary. Uh, dialects are uh, various emphasis. Um, this could include accents, etc. cetera. Um, but the ways in which uh, the syntax, right? So the, the grammar might change a little bit. Uh, so in the back of the screen here, you see things like you guys versus you all versus y'all. It all means the same thing. It's all out of, uh, it's all a, a part of the English language, but it's a dialect dependent on, you know, what region of the United States you're from, for instance, all right? Different organizations and professions have different ways of speaking. Uh, this is often referred to as jargon. So within, you know, then a business community, there's certain jargon that goes along with the field that you're going to be going into. Um, academic jargon, for instance, there's a few words that you probably won't hear that often outside of, outside of academia. Things like problematic, right, heteronormative discourse, et cetera. Um, yeah, these sort of like big, you know, $10 words that happen within academic circles. Um, and it, they're just words that come up often sort of in the literature and conversations. Uh, when I speak to people sort of outside of academia, there are certain words that I use that are just, uh, you, you know, that you, you, you get a look and, and you realize that those words aren't often used outside of various settings, right? And sort of field to field, discipline to discipline has their own set of, um, you know, special words, uh, interesting words that are, that are used. Uh, for you, it becomes so part, uh, it becomes so normal as part of your vocabulary uh, that you don't think of it. Um, you don't think that you don't realize that people outside of the in group that you're currently in uh, are unaware of these terms. All right. So sometimes uh, depending on the field you go into, you might have to slow down and rephrase and use different vocabulary to explain the topic that you're trying to explain. Um, now, the, the, the final question I have here on the slide is, you know, are people using jargon um, because it's needed, because it's, you know, it's it's very specific to the point you're trying to make? Uh, or do people use certain jargon to just be pretentious to sort of um, show that they are part of an in-group and you are part of the out-group, right? Uh, and the truth of the matter is language functions in both these dynamics. So there are, you know, special fields that need special vocabulary uh, in order to describe the specifics of the field. Uh, but then also people try to be chameleons, right? So the fake it till you make it mantra. Uh, I'm not part of the in-group yet, but if I can sort of adapt uh, the culture of the in-group, if I can adapt the language, um, possibly, you know, adapt the, the, the clothing, uh, the lifestyle, you know, where I live and what I drive. I'm slowly trying to get my foot in the door to be a part of the in-group with regard to how I carry myself, how I communicate, and the rest of it. All right. So there you have it. All right. Uh, in order to fit into a new culture, you need to sort of learn the code. All right. Uh, so here's a fun little, um, you know, meme off the internet. So summer vacay was grr eight cuz blah, 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 right? Tech speak is not cool at school, all right? Uh, so, you, but but you understand this. You you all understand that there's ways in which you write your papers that are different than the ways in which you text your friends uh, or the ways in which you write a post online on Facebook or, you know, Instagram or wherever people are posting things these days, all right? 
This is known as code switching. So when you switch the ways in which you are communicating as far as grammar or sentence structure, um, some of the vocabulary words, this is known as code switching. So being able to switch between cultural dialects. Now the foundation, for instance, would still be English, right? So most people who are a part, you know, who, who speak English can navigate the different dialects or, or parts of speech, um, slang, et cetera. They, they'll be able to navigate it, but uh, they might not necessarily speak it. They might not be on sort of like the inside track with regard to code switching. So you might have this with regard to, you know, how do you talk to your friends versus how you talk to your teachers? Uh, you might use, you know, you're going to use different ways to formulate that question. Um, you know, there might be profanity involved when you talk to your friends more often. Um, and not just profanity as far as profane words, but there might be uh, profane ways in which you address your friends, right? Uh, that you're not going to use in order to address a, a professor or a boss. Um, right, so there's ways in which you sort of cut into your friends, uh, you know, you, you put them down a little bit. Right, uh, but it's this gesture of uh, of showing you know um, you know camaraderie between you and your friends, right? So the code switching happens. Um, this you know this would happen to me sometimes uh, when I was an undergrad because I went to school in Michigan, um, but I'm from Illinois. Uh, well, still, when I go back to Illinois, uh, depending on how long I'm there, if I get around some of the people I grew up with, an accent starts to come out. I sort of slip back into uh, various. Uh, it's not a huge change as far as you know, Midwestern um, vocabulary, but there are certain words that start to slip out that, you know, I haven't used in a while, uh, simply because I'm in a different area of the country than the one I, I grew up in, all right? So, you know, yeah, your voice will change a little bit, the, the ways in which you address people, talk to people, uh, the grammar that you use. This is called code switching, all right? The whole purpose of communication in general, which we've gone over, you know, day one of class is I'm trying to encode a message. I have an idea in my head. I need to get it into your head and you have to decode the message. So we both need to sort of be on the same page with regard to the code in which we're sharing, right? The English language uh, in order to properly communicate. All right. So that's the, 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 the easiest one. Um, oh, and a fun little question to think about is if whether or not, you know, you and your siblings have, you know, have a certain kind of secret code that you all might talk in with one another. Um, I've definitely seen this with you know, various families. Um, you know, you might go over to a girlfriend or boyfriend's house for Christmas, and then they start sort of falling into these ways of speaking to their siblings um, that you can't understand, but, you know, they're all getting a good laugh out of it because it's something that they sort of invented when they were six years old as far as this sort of speak secret code in order to communicate with one another to maybe sort of get around, you know, polite conversations with mom and dad. Okay, so some actual code, right? The way we think about code more often. All right, uh, so I have two examples from World War II. Okay, so in World War II, um, there was a problem uh, that the Japanese could speak English and they could easily intercept American messages. All right, and so World War II, came, uh, the people in charge of World War II had this problem. They're like, how are we gonna make sure that we can code a message in a way that when we send it off to you know the ships and the submarines that are in the pacific uh it's not intercepted by the japanese and then easily translated back into english so this is how a code gets written as far as you know we're talking like secret you know military codes you start with the base language and the base language is english right and when you send off an english message you have to put it into some sort of code and then when the people receive it you know the, the your soldiers out on the battlefield they are translating it back into english so that they can read whatever the code was so when the base language is english what was happening is that the japanese soldiers who were intercepting these messages knew that they had to take the code that we were sending out to our ships and get it back into english well if you know that you're trying to get this code back into english uh, it's going to take a it's going to take a while, right? It's not easy work, but it's easier to sort of look at whether it's binary code. It's full of numbers. Um, maybe you know there's certain letters, and each letter corresponds to a number, or a number can correspond to a letter, right? There's all these like little fancy ways to kind of mess up the code, right? But Japan, even though they didn't have you know the um, the the material necessary to decode the message, they knew that they would get this jumbled message and they knew at the end of it they had to take this entire jumbled message 
and get it back into English. And so once you start fill, figuring out, it's like, okay, the one corresponds with the letter O. So now all the ones in this document could correspond to an O, right? And then a three corresponds to an N, right? And then all the, you know, it's corresponded to an N in the message. And they just know that they have to go back to English. This was a problem because with enough time, right? Uh, even though the codes are complicated, you know, plenty of smart people in Japan are working on these codes and they just are saying like, the US sent it out in English, it's all jumbled, but we know we just have to make this code make sense in English and they were translating this stuff. So what ends up happening is there's this guy in the military named Philip Johnston. Philip Johnston grew up in and around uh, Native American reservations in the Southwest, all right? And he goes to his commanders and says, hey, what if we don't make English the base language? Instead, let's confuse the Japanese and we are going to use uh, the, the language of the Navajo Indians as the base language. And Japan is going to have no idea that when they get this code, they actually have to translate it into Navajo before that they then take it into Navajo and then they put it back in English, right? And so this is going to confuse the hell out of the Japanese. So this is, uh, these were called, uh, these individuals who were recruited uh, from Native American communities were known as the wind talkers, right? Um, and the Navajo language in and of itself is a very complicated language. Uh, and it, it, it just, it's difficult to sort of fig to, to, to figure out um, sort of uh, grammar that's similar or words that are similar, right? So for instance, like if you study um, French, like French is very similar to Spanish, Spanish and, you know, French and Spanish and English and Italian, it's like they're all, they're different, but they, you, you kind of see how they fit together, right? What the Navajo Native American, what the Navajo Indians were, were speaking was so radically different than any language that we had access to, right, uh, in the United States, that the US commander said, okay, you know what we're gonna do instead? We're gonna take this English message and, we, and the end, at the end of it, the boats need to get an English message. But before we put it into code, we're going to go from English and we're going to have these Navajo Indians translate it into their language. And then they're going to send it out in some crazy code, right? With numbers and letters and what have you, right? And then there's going to be Navajo Indians on the boats and they're going to take the code. They're going to translate it into Navajo. And then they're going to be able to tell their commanders on the ship, what's the English message, all right? So what happened in the middle here is the Japanese were still intercepting our messages, but they thought they were supposed to get it into English instead of getting it into Navajo, all right? So this really confused the Japanese. Um, it made it extremely difficult because the Japanese couldn't figure out what language they were supposed to take this code and put it into. Um, and so the Japanese, even though they were intercepting our messages, they couldn't decipher them, all right? Um, so this specifically helped with the invasion of Iwo Jima. Uh, behind here, uh, the Marines uh, putting up the flag, raising the flag. You've probably seen this image. It's a very famous um, image. It's you know statues. It's on, you know it's it's a very famous picture, right? Um, this is the invasion of Iwo Jima, um, and th this helped immensely, right? Because the, the, we're we're able to plan out the attack in order to get men off of the boat onto the island, right? And now all of a sudden we have a foothold sort of on land with regard to um, figuring out sort of how to strategically, um, you know, uh, defend ourselves against the, the Japanese, all right? So this was important. Japan did not know the code um, with regard to the Navajo language. They couldn't decipher it. All right, another important person uh, from World War II is Alan Turing. Uh, you've probably heard this name before. Um, you might have seen the movie, which I'll talk about on the next slide, all right? Now, this is on the other end. So with the Japanese, we're having a problem sending our messages. With Alan Turing, his job was we were having a hard time deciphering what the German messages were when we were intercepting German messages, all right? So during World War II, the Nazis had this unbreakable code, right? Um, and it and the code changed every day, so it would take you know two weeks to figure out what the what the uh, the way to the decipher the code. But the problem with that is that the code's already changed 14 times since you figured out the last code, right? 
So this became a huge problem, obviously. All right. So they bring in this young, young kid who's like in his early to mid twenties, named Alan Turing, right? And he led Hut Eight, right, of the government code and cipher school. Uh, he ends up creating this thing called the Turing machine, which was able to turn these messages into decipherable math equations. And then once you figure out the algorithm, right, uh, then that algorithm sort of parses it down into uh, German, which was then sort of easily translated by, you know, uh, people in the United States, right? Um, so he starts getting these codes in, and, he, and I'll show you a picture of the machine on the next slide. Um, he gets this code, he runs it through this machine, and this machine is essentially trying to take this code and figure out this, like an infinite amount of possibilities that how you could decipher this code, and then it sort of creates on the back end, like what's the most likely way in which this code can be deciphered, right? So if you have a code and there's an infinite amount of ways to decipher it, let's put it through the machine and the machine is gonna run all those calculations as fast as a computer would, right? It's gonna run all these calculations as quickly as possible and it's gonna sort of spit out which uh, computation makes the most sense, right? Then we're able to take that equation, translate it into German, and now we know where the Germans are, all right? Um, and so, uh, Alan Turing and his team uh, were able to come up with this, right? Brilliant, brilliant stuff, okay? How do you make a machine to decipher a code when you don't know what the code is? That's kind of incredible. Um, it's predicted that his work shortened the war by two years and saved 14 million lives because what we we're able to do is we were able to start intercepting um, uh, where the Germans were going. So we were able to stop Germany before they would get to the next place they were going to uh, uh, invade, right? So Hitler would call up his guys and say like, move your boat from this place to this location. And we would learn that. And so our boats would already be there, right? Move our, you know, move your men from this location to this other location. We were able to get there before them. And, you know, um, you know, it, it, it sort of stops the spread of Nazism, all right? Um, so it shortens the war by two years and saves 14 million lives. This is incredible. All right, um, so this right here, this machine, uh, this is a picture of the Turing machine. Um, all of these little uh, circles, um, they're little knobs, you know, the size of c CDs or so, and all of them, you know, you put in, a, you know, the code, the slip of paper, they all start calculating, you know, multiple ways in which you can interpret this. Um, the end, you just Google it on YouTube if you want, like these obviously extremely complicated machines, all right? But he figures out how to do this. Uh, there's this movie called The Imitation Game over here, um, which some of you might have seen. If you haven't, I highly recommend watching it. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a good movie uh, that sort of shows you, you know, how this how, how this whole process played out, right? Um, okay, with Alan Turing, uh, there's also this thing called the Turing Test that he sort of you know, as, as a thought experiment. Um, what the Turing test, the Turing test is, is as we sort of get closer and closer to machines uh, replicating human behaviors or human thoughts, uh, we call this artificial intelligence, right? The test is whether or not an actual human can tell the difference between a real human and a, a robot, an artificial intelligence, right? An AI, right? And this is supposed to tell us whether or not that um, artificial intelligence has some sort of consciousness, right? Whether or not that artificial intelligence is making decisions on its own, right? Um, or whether or not everything's been programmed into it, okay? Uh, and so this is how you sort of differentiate between like, when do we cross that threshold towards, like this is a very high functioning artificial intelligence, this is a very high functioning computer to, I think this computer is starting to think on its own. All right, and this is called the Turing test, all right? Um, I mean, there, there's been a couple cases where people have said that they've created AI that has some sort of consciousness. Uh, nothing's really sort of um, come of it yet, but you know, the longer this you know, whole human experiment uh, goes on, I'm sure that at some point it's gonna happen, all right? There's plenty of movies that sort of talk about artificial intelligence, et cetera. Um, I would highly recommend checking out this movie called Ex Machina, which was a pretty small independent film that blew up a few years ago. Um, but the whole movie is sort of based around this computer genius creates an artificial intelligence and he brings in one of his you know, programmers. Basically, it's like, you know, a Google executive makes an artificial intelligence, brings in one of the Google, you know, low level middle management programmer guys 
and just says like, hey, interact with this, you know, uh, interact with this robot for a week and let's see if it can pass the Turing test, right? Let's see if this robot has some sort of consciousness where it's acting on its own as opposed to only acting the way in which I programmed it to act, right? So where do we cross that threshold? Um, so this is a scene from the movie. Uh, you can kind of see they're behind a plate of glass. Obviously, this is the artificial intelligence uh, and this is the programmer. And they sort of get together and have these um, back and forth conversations for a week. Um, and it's, I think it's a very well done movie that um, gives a lot of good uh, insight into you know some of the cautionary, some of the things we should be caution, uh, uh, caution uh, cautiousness. We should have some caution um, with regard to artificial intelligence. All right. Now with Alan Turing, this is also important information as far as just socially. All right. Um, in 1952, Turing, and again, remember he's a war hero, right? Um, he's this super super intelligent guy who hung out in a hut, right? And was just doing calculations the whole time. So he wasn't in the line of fire, right? But he, you know, arguably shortens the, the war by two years, ends up saving, you know, at least 10 million lives, maybe more, okay? Because of the work that he did, all right? So he's a war hero, right? Uh, in 1952, um, which is a few years after the war's over, right? Um, he's convicted of homosexuality, right? This is when it's a crime, all right, in the United Kingdoms. Um, he underwent chemical castration, right, uh, to sort of like make it so he didn't, you know, engage in homosexual activities uh, to try to like cure him of homosexuality, right? These are all, this is all the terrible language of the, you know, mid 20th century. Um, and then after this, there's just so many like, drugs in his system to try to cure him of this and the ways in which he was sort of treated after the war. Uh, he ends up committing suicide uh, via cyanide, which is a poison. He just takes it on his own. Um, and, uh, at the, and he's only 42 years old, right? So again, this is someone who gets involved in the war effort uh, when he's in his uh, when he's in his mid 20s, um, does something that, you know, that is impossible for anybody else on the planet to do. Right. Uh, in creating this um, in creating this computer system to decipher codes. Uh, and then he's shortly thereafter, everybody kind of forgets. They treat him like garbage uh, and he ends up um, killing himself as a result of it. Um, so this is just an important social story that you should uh, remember. Um, in a similar way, you know, you might think of his story similar to some of the ways in which uh, African-American soldiers were treated when they when they came home uh, from World War Two. Right. It's like. Go out and fight the war over in Europe, um, or you know, in the in, you know in the Pacific uh, against Japan, and then you know come home to you know Jim Crow laws and segregation and the, and the rest of it. So obviously, you know, some cognitive dissonance uh, in, in both of these regards with regard to the ways in which people are treated sort of during the war. We need you, but when you come home, we're still gonna uh, be not you know we're gonna we're gonna uh, be oppressive. We're gonna be we're gonna sort of create um, we're, gonna, we're not going to make your life easy. All right. Uh, so just know that story is he's an important story to know. All right. So the wind talkers, Alan Turry, you're going to need to know both these things for the exam, but beyond the exam, you should just know that these individuals existed. All right. Finally, uh, the ways in which we think about code breaking, um, some, just some other fun ways is with regard to, you know, various puzzles that you might see, all right. So various different math puzzles. So for instance, you know, you have these, kind of fun little ways where this seems very obvious, one plus four equals five, right? Because we know what the plus sign means, we know what the value of one and four is and how five and the equals, like these are sort of like little symbols that we put in front of numbers in order to know the function to uh, perform in order to get these answers. But then you say, okay, well, now you have this thing, two plus five equals 12. And you're like, okay, maybe the plus sign doesn't mean plus anymore. Like these are just little, you know, like cutesy little puzzles. What does the equal sign really mean? Is the value of five, like, can we change that? Like, how does this work in order to sort of figure out, you know, these little codes and these little puzzles that, you know, exist in our newspapers, all right? Um, yeah, so just various puzzles, right? Uh, you have, you know, star plus uh, pentagon plus triangle plus star, right? And like 17, like, it's like, okay, now what's the value of a star? What's the value of a pentagon sort of in these little puzzles, right? Um, so. Puzzles are all about, you know, trying to break little codes. All right. And finally, and more, a little bit more um, allegorical, if you will, right? Code breaking, right? If you want to be a part of a group, 
you have to learn the language and language i mean that in a broad sense not only do you need to sort of you know uh learn the vocabulary and the syntax but the language is sort of the way in which that culture operates right if you want to be a lawyer it's like what's a lawyer culture if you want to be a part of a fortune 500 company it's like how do i dress how do i act how do i um present myself you know like you know show up to work early leave late you know, are there events on the weekends? Are there books I should be reading? Like, who should I be mimicking and whose behavior should I be mimicking in order to sort of fit in um, with it, with this, with this, uh, you know, group of people I want to fit in with. Um, just recently, I was sort of revisiting uh, The Great Gatsby. I teach it in uh, one of my fall classes in um, April of 1925 is when it was first published. So a couple weeks ago, they celebrated the 96th anniversary of its publication, um, you know, online with newsletters, et cetera. Um, but The Great Gatsby is a similar type of story, right? I won't give too much away, but it's about this poor kid who kind of grows up in this farm family in the Midwest. And then he, he but he wants to be part of like the New York elite social club. And he sort of talks about, you know, in his like late teenage and early 20s, um, you know, he just sort of starts to mimic the behavior of, you know, New York elite. Right. To sort of blend in, to make sure that nobody knows he's just this poor farmer from the Midwest. But instead, he's like, OK, how do I dress? How do I act? How do I talk? Right. Um, he puts himself through like elocutionary lessons. He practices talking and diction right, in order to blend in so that people don't think that he's some, you know, Midwest farmer. Right. Um, so learning the language. Uh, this could include, again, foreign language. So before you go overseas to a different country, you know, learn a few, you know, fun little words and uh, phrases. Uh, it could be with, with regard to like foreign culture, right? So learn the customs. So we have this phrase like when in Rome, do as the Romans do, which means like when you are sort of in a certain culture, just kind of take it on, like fully embrace it. When you're in Rome, sort of act like a Roman. You know, when you go to um, China, if there's a specific custom that's going on, it's like partake in it. Uh, if you go to Tanzania, if there's certain customs that are going on, it's like follow the customs. All right, just sort of like try to fully embrace the, the culture around you. Um, if you're going into mathematics, algorithms, obviously, you know, speaking in code, they call it code, right? When you're, you know, creating programs for various computers. Um, and then finally, like, we get to academics. So this goes back to our discussion on like the Western canon, et cetera. If you want to be an academic, which my assumption is that you do since you're in college, right? You want to be a part of this, this group that says like, I'm a college educated person. There's certain books that you should know about, right? There's certain words that you should ha have incorporated into, you know, your everyday vocabulary, your jargon, all that kind of stuff, right? But again, this goes like the book discussion is just, you know, there are a list of about, you know, 150, 200 books that you should read or at least have a good working knowledge of if you haven't read them yet, all right? There's just some important people. And if you have a certain, you know, depending on the degree that you have, you know, psychology, sociology, mathematics, communication, you know, you know, whatever. It's like there's certain scholars that you just know about, right? So if you're a college educated person, there's just a list of, you know, 150, 200 books, authors, you know, some pieces of artwork. It's like you should just have a working understanding of what these things are um, if you want to sort of hang out in those academic circles, right? And this isn't a pretentious talk. If you don't want to, there's plenty of people who have no interest in learning anything about Shakespeare, for instance. Like, and I don't want to force people to learn about Shakespeare if they don't want to, right? But there's, you know, some sort of cultural expectations um, in academia that says, if you're going to be here, these are the things that you need to have a basic understanding about um, as far as culture and literature and art and history and the rest of it, all right? Uh, so this goes back, you know, way back to day one when we talked about, like, what is a liberal arts degree? Okay, so that's where we're at. All right, uh, a little bit of fun with some of the code breaking stuff. I just wanted to, mostly I just want to introduce you to, you know, people like the Wind Talkers as well as Alan Turing. Um, so, yeah, just look them over. Um, hope you learned a little something, and I will see you all next time.